the most contested book in actually probably the whole Bible is Genesis. You know why it's the most contested book? Because Genesis tells us who we really are. In the beginning, God created. In the beginning, God did this. In the beginning, God formed the heaven and the earth. God made the trees. God made the plants. God made the birds. And at the pinnacle of God's creation, he creates man. We need to come to that understanding that we are not just some kind of cosmic being floating through the universe. We are a definite creation of the creator God. Now, I was watching a YouTube video just recently. It was a production from the BBC. They must have 60 minutes on the BBC. I've never seen it before, but I was researching something to do with Genesis, and there was a scientist on the BBC saying that they had discovered dinosaur tissue. Not fossilized dinosaur, dinosaur tissue. She was in the lab and they had sent, been sent these specimens of dinosaur parts and she had on a vial in, in front of their microscope and she had put the wrong acid on this sample. And she said when she started to move the sample, she saw the sample stretched. So this is supposedly some part of the dinosaur remains that were uncovered and, and it stretched. She called the other scientist in who swore her to an oath never to disclose this particular thing on fear of losing her job. Why? Because it takes thousands and thousands and thousands of years to fossilize dinosaur tissue. So if they had found literal tissue that was still not fossilized, what does that mean? It means that that tissue was less than thousands and thousands and thousands of years old and it would completely undermine this philosophy of millions of years. Most dinosaurs date from the 150 million years to the 200 million years old. So what does it do to that archaeological record? Everything that they've believed up to that point has just been absolutely wiped out by scientific evidence that shows... Dinosaurs were on this planet not so many thousand years ago, which would probably even more so back up the whole Noah's Ark theory that when the flood raged across the earth, maybe there weren't certain animals that survived after that. That's the Christian theory most Christians hold why dinosaurs aren't here today. Most people don't disagree with the dinosaur theory. What they disagree with is that they're 150 million years old. So we live in this generation today who's being sold this constant lie of evolution, constant lie of, and even when you, if you go on YouTube, you can look that up. If you look up um, live dinosaur tissue um, on the BBC, it was a special run on the 60 Minutes. It was actually removed from YouTube for quite a long time. You couldn't actually, I went on there multiple times to try and find it again to show certain students of mine. And now it's only just recently come back on. So whether someone's reposted it back on there and it hasn't been taken down yet. But you can go on and have a look at that report. But scientists are saying, oh, it was probably now, to explain it, it was probably encapsulated in some kind of carbon that preserved the tissue. They've got to come up with some kind of theory. Why? Because it, it, it completely blows their theory out of the water of evolution. Why am I sharing this today? Because we're going to look at Psalm 139. Psalm 139 is one of the, I think, the greatest psalms in the book of Psalms. Psalm 1, I love Psalm 1, but I love a Psalm 139. Why is Psalm 139 so important? At first look, when you read Psalm 139, it's easy to look at Psalm 139 and go, just take it at a one plain kind of one thought kind of process right throughout. But the truth is, Psalm 139 is a dual-edged sword. There's two kind of things that David says through this psalm that represent not only the imminence of God, but the transcendence of God. Now, let me explain those two things. Transcendent 
When we worship God, we worship what we call a transcendent God. God is so far above our human understanding, our human mind, we can't comprehend just how great and how big God is. But we know that he is far above all things. We have no problem with that, do we, church? But we also believe in a God that is imminent, which means that not only is he so far above, so far beyond, but he's also a God that is concerned about the smallest little hair on your head. This God that created the universe with a single breath of his mouth is is concerned about how many hairs you have on your head. When we worship God, we come to a God that is so two ways that we we have to worship in those two ways most worship songs when you listen to a worship song how great is our God we're worshiping the transcendence of God how big is our God when we sing speak the name of Jesus over our families why because we know that he's a God who cares about intimately about us So we have to actually look at Psalm 139 from a two-pronged aspect of what David is saying about God in this passage. So let's start. It says in Psalm 139, 1 through 18, You have searched me, Lord, and you know me. You know when I sit, you know when I rise. You perceive my thoughts from afar. You discern my going out and my lying down. You are familiar with all my ways. Before a word is on my tongue, you, Lord, know it completely. David begins this revelation of God with the first thing that he says about God is this. God is omniscient which means God knows everything. There is not a thought, there is not a word that you speak, there is not an action that you do that God does not know about. There is not a thing that you can say that he doesn't know that you're going to speak it before you've spoken it. He knows when you get up, he knows when you lie down. God knows everything. David came to this incredible revelation. God, there is something about you that I I just must write down in this incredible song. Because remember, the Psalms were poetry songs that they used to recite. And he was, God, you know me so well. And let me just say this. There's a Hebrew word that David uses in that Psalm for know. Now, in the Old Testament, that word know in the Hebrew is a word yada. I don't know if I pronounced that correctly, but it's Y-A-W-D-A-H, Yoda. What it means is a deep knowing. But when we actually look at some of the other contexts where Yoda was used, we actually can go right back to Genesis 4.1, where it says, Adam, Yoda, Eve, and she gave birth to a son. It's where we get our biblical understanding or our biblical term to know someone, to know them intimately as a lover knows his wife intimately. That was the context. Adam, Yada, Eve. Adam had a relationship with Eve to the point where they were able to conceive a child. David wasn't saying God knows you from afar, God knows. He was saying he knows and, and let me just say, most of us are husband and wife here, so we can kind of touch a little bit on this area. You know that in that intimate relationship, you know your partner really well. True? This is the word David uses. He says, God, you know me. You are this omniscient God who sees everything about me. That was his first revelation. God, David goes on to say this, you hem me in behind and before me and you lay your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me, too lofty for me to attain. Where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I go up to the heavens, you are there. If I make my bed in the depths, you are there. If I rise on the wings of the dawn, if I settle on the far side of the sea, even there... 
your hand will guide me. Your right hand will hold me fast. If I say, surely the darkness will hide me and the light become night around me, even the darkness will not be dark to you. The night will shine like the day for the darkness is as light to you. What is David really saying here? He's saying, God, no matter where I go, He's turned his now attention off the omniscience of God to the omnipresence of God. He's saying, God, if I go down to the depths, guess what? Your presence is there. And when he uses going down into the depths, church, he uses the same Hebrew terminology that they use for the word hell. If I go down to that place where those who are outside of your kingdom go, Even God, when I go down to that place, guess what? God, you're there. God is omnipresent. He is everywhere at once. David has this incredible revelation. God, I stand in awe of you because everywhere, there is nowhere I can go. Even if it was a good situation, God, you were there. God, even in the bad situation, you were there. God is omnipresent. But I'm going to move on because we need to get through. There's a lot to get through. So let me just keep going. Then David comes, I think, to the pinnacle of Psalm 139 where he says in verse 13, For you created my inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you for I am fearfully and wonderfully made and your works are wonderful. I know that full well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in the secret place, when I was woven together in the depths of the earth. The last theological thing that David says about God in this passage is that God is omnipotent. I love Star Wars. Most of you know that I'm a huge Star Wars fan. Dennis says it all the time. But there's one scene in Star Wars where Anakin Skywalker wants to save his wife, Padme. Now, he's been courting her secretly. And he realizes he has these dreams of the future where she's going to die. And he wants to try and save his wife. So he basically sells his soul to the dark side of the Force because the dark side of the Force, the the Emperor or the Dark Lord of the Sith says, I conceive your wife. I have the power to create life. And then, you know, in that scene, you go, I have the power to create life. You're like, who has the power to create life? Only God has the power to create life. What David came to is this incredible revelation that God is so powerful that he is the one who is able to create life. He says, God, you knit me together in my mother's womb. You know, sometimes we look in the mirror and kind of like, oh my gosh, wish I was different. But you know what? God knit us together. He purposed us to be who we are. He formed you in your mother's womb. He saw your unformed body. And I always take great encouragement in this simple truth. The days ordained for us were written in his book. Devil's not going to snatch them out before they're done. What we are on this earth, for the length that we are on this earth, is ordained by God and nothing can take that away. If he's destined you to be here for this particular time, he's destined you to be here for this particular time. People said to me when I bought a motorbike, what do you want a motorbike for? You're just going, my mum was off the chart. She was like, oh, you're going to crash and kill yourself. Because I was never a really good rider when I was young. So my brother was always the very, very hands-on, very good at stuff. So she was stressing out. And I'm like, I don't need to stress. Why? Because I know that my days... Now, I'm not trying to rush God, but I know that my days are ordained for me in his book. That I will be on this planet for as long as God says I'll be on this planet. So David has the three revelations. He shares these three things clearly about the the power or the um the uh let me look at this word again, the transcendence of God. But here's where the passage becomes twofold. 
David starts to turn this around in everything that he's written to what has almost like never been written before. This psalm seems to sum up this passion of David in a way that, that if we can just grab this, it's such an encouragement. He starts to turn it around to the imminence of God. Yes, we can look at the transcendence of God in this passage, but David takes the passage really into this. It's not God that you were all these things, but you're all these things to me. God, it's not that you're the creator of the universe, but you're the creator of me. God, it's not that you're all powerful and can sustain life, but it's that you chose my life. David brings us this one simple understanding or one truth that it's not only for him, but it's also for us. That not only is the God the creator of David, but David says God is the creator of all mankind. God knows us. Church, we've got to get to that point where we understand one simple truth about God and, and hold on to that one simple truth. There is nothing that we go through in this life that God doesn't know about. There is nothing, no struggle, no thought, no hardship that we go through that God doesn't fully comprehend it more than we comprehend it ourselves. Secondly, there is no place that we can go where God's present isn't. Where God won't hold us fast in that situation. I love passage in verse 5 where he says this, God, you hem me in behind and before me such an overlooked little verse now i watched a documentary so i must be an expert at it already that was a joke actually by the way <laughs> i love how this generation the younger generation can google something and we're an expert at it all right i just got to google on my phone i, I know everything about it <laughs> it's funny i watched this documentary on droving cattle or herding cattle out west on some of these huge big farms. You know, farms that are, you know, like, they don't measure them in acres anymore. They measure them in square kilometres. You know, it's, it's 300 square kilometres of this way. Or, and they would always drive these cattle on this farm to a fence because these fences obviously lead somewhere. So they drive the cattle to the fence and then they just herd them along the fence. Why? Because it hems them in. It, they're not spread out. They're hemmed in by a fence line. And you know what happens? Eventually in a paddock, a fence comes to a, another fence, which brings you to a certain point. And so often in life, we need to understand this, that God's hemming us in, and it might seem like, God, why, why can't I get through this situation? Why, why am I always beating against this? Stop beating against it. Just go with it. So often we fight against the things that God's actually putting in there to hem us in, to actually bring us to the point where he wants us to go. Because eventually we're going to come to another junction that will focus into a very small point and we go, God, now I know why I'm here and why I'm doing what I'm doing. God loves you enough never to leave you or forsake you, but to always take you to that point in your life where you need to be. Because he says this, I know the plans I have you for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you a hope and a future. God's more interested not in your comfort, but he's more interested in getting you to the point where you need to be to be effective for the kingdom, to fulfill the destiny of why you're on this earth. Do you know, I went through a bit of a, a struggle the last two years, and Kerry will tell you, I've been, I've been almost fighting depression in some ways. And that's not got anything to do with the midlife crisis, by the way. But when you step out of a particular ministry, you feel lost for a time. You, you, and I knew God was calling me out. God was going, it's time for you to hand the reins. It's time for you to, to, to let go, Elijah, and, and pass that mantle down to a younger generation after you to come on up and, and take the reins. And I'm like, oh, how, how do you let go of this God? But yet God's placed me in, in a field where I'm now probably connecting with 300 kids a week. 
And I go, God, that's, that's where you want me to be. But it was like God had to almost force me and get me to this place where he's hemming me in. And I'm like, oh, I'm just, I just have to make this. And oh, hang on, I'm here where God wants me to be. God hems us in behind and before us to bring us to that place of his destiny. The amazing thing that God that David says about God in the last passage is that he created us. This is where I really want to get serious, church, because I've, I've been building right up to this point. What did I say at the beginning of the message? When we know something, we can truly appreciate or love that something. When we come to this point of actually acknowledging or getting to this point where we truly believe that the person sitting next to us is an incredible creation of God, equipped with incredible talents from God, that is ordained by God to fulfill a set purpose and plan, we will start to look at the person next to us differently. We will start to treat them differently. Look at the person next to you right now. They are an incredible creation of God. Ordained by him to fulfill an incredible purpose in him. My question is, church, who are we? We are the creation of God of an incredible creator. I love the Noah story. Who's, who's watched the Russell Crowe movie that, with Noah in it? Okay. I know there was some terrible theology in that movie. All right. The whole thing about the angels that have fallen being redeemed, that ain't going to happen. All right. But one of the things I loved about that movie is, is Russell Crowe always referred to God as creator. The creator. Even the little rock, you know, the angels that were encased in this rock, the creator, all right? You can't say that about God without feeling this kind of like, he is, he's the creator of the universe. But not only just this incredible God that creates a universe, but this incredible God that creates the person sitting next to us, the person that we are. Do you know, I've come to this point Or if I could do one thing, one thing in this life that could make a difference would be to help people understand you are an incredible creation of God. That you have an incredible purpose in God. And that when you find that incredible purpose in God, you'll find the most incredible fulfillment in this life. Do you know, when I was being baptized, church, I, uh, I was baptized in a Baptist church up the road, and they had the big baptismal pool. It was, it's huge. It's like this swimming pool. Well, actually, one day, <laughs> the youth group, we filled it up and went swimming in it, which we got in a lot of trouble for. But it was a hot day, and we thought, we'll just fill the baptismal pool up, and we all jumped in there and had a swim around, which to some of the more um, discerning members of our con- congregation was a little bit uh, irreverent. Which it probably was. Okay, I can admit I was a bit irreverent. But we filled, a, we filled the baptism. Of, well, when I was baptized, let me get back to my story of being baptized. Right up to that point in my life, I had grown up in a pretty dysfunctional family. And my mum had an extramarital affair when I was born. So I was actually born in that affair, while my twin brother and I were born in that affair, my mum went back to her husband and they reconciled and my brother and I were led to believe that the man who we thought was our dad was our dad, when actually, in fact, he was not our dad. He was not our biological father whatsoever. He took on that role of being our father and led us to believe that he was definitely our biological father. And it was interesting because one day we were driving in the car and I believe it was a God thing. I was 12 years old. And I remember sitting in the car and, and this thought just hit me, that guy's not your dad. 
I don't know where it come from. I, I believe probably was a, a God thing. It was the Holy Spirit. And I was on the verge of asking him, are you really my dad? I didn't. I was too scared. I was absolutely frozen in fear. Like, is, is this guy really my dad? When I was baptized, I had this incredible experience that when I went down into the water and I came up, I heard not the audible voice of God, but who's ever heard the voice of God where you, it's, it could almost be like as if it was audible. It's that strong and that powerful that you, you just you hear it, but no one else hears it. I don't know if it was audible or not, but there was this incredible sense where God said to me, you are my son and with you I'm well pleased. I had never, never heard that from my family before. Never from my earthly dad had I ever heard, you know, you are my son. And with you, I'm well pleased. Some years after that, my grandmother died. And because of family, you know what it's like when someone in the family dies and, you know, their estate's got to be divided up. It gets ugly. And my aunties became very ugly about with my mum and who was going to inherit what and blah, blah, blah. And the truth was going to come out. So my mum comes to me and she hands me a piece of paper and she says, Jared, this is, this is the name of your real dad. It hit me like a brick. But I was like, do you know what? It's like I knew that already. So some years later, we, we met my real dad. My brother and I tracked him down and we've had a good relationship ever since. We, we get on like a house on fire. We are so alike. But you know the truth is this. None of us, none of us are here today because of a human decision. Because some mum one day decided that she wanted to have a child or some dad wanted to have a child. We're here today, church, because the Bible clears, clearly tells us that we're here today because of a decision of an almighty God. We're here today because he ordained us. He knit us together in our mother's womb. He sustained us to that point where we were given birth to and ever since, he has watched over our life and brought us to where we are now. Hemmed us in, cared about us, loved us. Church, if we can start to appreciate or know that simple fact, we'll start to treat each other differently. I don't know why there's always jealousy in church. Why is it when, when there's people in areas of ministry, oh, they've been promoted above me. Why are we jealous about that? Why do people get jealous about that? I think it's incredibly sad because we should be going, wow, praise God that that person is now fulfilling their destiny in him. I love that person, that incredible creation of God. Glad to see that they're happy and doing well in the kingdom. Because when we know something, we can love something. Church, I want to close there. I'm going to get the worship team back up. I'm going to share two other problems when maybe maybe Dennis might get me back to preach, might not. <laughs> two other things, two important truths about our world today. The first is we've got to acknowledge this. We've got to come to this point of accepting it, grappling with it, walking in faith in it, that we're here because God wants us here. We're an incredible creation of his. We are his children. And if we can help the world out there discover that, there is a God that created them and loves them and wants to know them. I think that's where evangelism really starts. So I'm going to hand it back to the team. But if you'd like prayer this morning. You know, sometimes we go through life and it doesn't work out the way we think maybe there's some of us here this morning who are going through that in their life I don't know God why, why I'm doing what I'm doing why am I here if that's you I want to just pray to encourage you this morning because God has God's hemming you in God's bringing you to that place 
So if you need prayer for that this morning, if there's a point in your life where you feel like, why am I here? What am I doing, God? Maybe there's some of us here this morning who don't actually understand fully or haven't grappled with that fully. I'm this incredible creation. I don't have to hide myself under a rock. I don't have to hide myself away because I don't feel good enough because guess what? God doesn't make second best. God's given you the incredible skills, the talents. They are already there. What you need is just get more of His Holy Ghost on you to fan into flame that which is already there. My old pastor used to say this, you know, there's, there's, there's the wood and there's the fire. You're the wood. So often we look at the wood and go, well, it's pretty, pretty ordinary, that wood. Yes, it is. But you put fire on that thing. What happens to it? It becomes powerful. So church, maybe that's you this morning. Maybe you need prayer for that. Maybe you, Carrie and I, Carrie's here. She loves to pray for people. She'll definitely pray for us this morning. But let me just close this service. Father, I want to thank you so much for your church. I want to thank you so much for your word. And I pray, God, this morning that each of us would leave here this morning, God, with maybe that little deeper understanding of those people around us. That we would look to those around us in this body, in the community we live, and we would truly understand to a greater depth, God, that they are your creation, loved by you. They may have fallen into all manner of different sin or strife, but they are still your creation. And I pray, God, that you give us a deeper heart and love, different appreciation or a different understanding or knowing today of who we are and who they are. In Jesus' name I ask, amen.